Ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, my name is Romanos. I am a historian and we are continuing our journey in this beautiful story about Byzantium. If you like this story, feel free to hit the like button, comment and subscribe to this new channel to be notified when a new video is uploaded. You can also leave your own suggestions about how this story should continue in the comments section. Suggestions regarding not only the presentation of the story, but also how the character should move and what decision should make. This will give me the needed feedback to improve my videos and will engage all of you in the creation of these videos. In the previous episode, we saw how finally Byzantium managed to sign an alliance with a powerful country, and we saw the war with Serbia and its ally Bosnia. Now Byzantium needed a period of peace. Ioannis needed to consolidate his gains in Greece and the Balkans, improve the economy, increase the manpower reserves, build a sizable army and prepare for the next war with the Ottomans. His first priority was to send administrative personnel in the Serbian provinces to integrate them in the Byzantine core. Then, he seized land from the estates and this reduced the positive monthly autonomy change to 0.10%. The decisions that he had to make for the war with the Ottomans still had a negative impact in the economy of Byzantium. The autonomy of the local estates increased every month. And when he decreased the autonomy in each province, no rebels spawned like in Corinth. Ioannis mothballed the forts, except the fort in Morea, to keep the control of the region and handle the rebellion in Corinth. As a result, the rebels didn't manage to increase the autonomy in Corinth. Ioannis sent the mercenary army to fight the rebels, but he denied to support them with any supplies. So, naturally, they lost to the rebels. Now, he had to resupply his main army to fight the rebels. In this whole period of consolidation, in an effort to reduce expenses, we will see many decisions that were not rational. The forts were mothballed only to be used again a few days later. The army maintenance was reduced only to be increased to the maximum the next month. The result of all those administrative mistakes was that Ioannis did not get the economic benefits that he expected. For example, after this battle, the mercenaries were so depleted that he decided to disband them. A whole loan that he took when he hired them was now lost. In the 24th of January of 1453, he decided to develop Komotini administratively and complete the agenda that was promised to the clergy. This increased their loyalty and the prestige of the emperor. Ioannis wanted to seize even more land from the nobles, but he could not do that before 1457. But the costly decisions regarding the mercenary armies that Ioannis frequently used also had some benefits. Byzantium, even after the war with Serbia, had a manpower reserve of 4,300 men, which was a number higher than the one they started the war. The Byzantine manpower, slowly but surely, was recovering. In the 1st of March of 1453, Byzantium had a military technological advance. They adopted the general use of pike squares in their army. With this new advance, the Byzantine armies increased their morale by 0.5 and improved their tactics by 0.25. A few days later, Ioannis finally converted northern Greece into state, 
and reduced the local autonomy in Arta, Epirus and Kefalonia. In this period, he had a continuous battle against the nobles to impose the central power of his government in each and every province. Nevertheless, Byzantium still had a deficit because of the expenses needed to fight corruption in the newly conquered provinces. Although Byzantium needed iron to expand the army, Ioannis decided not to import iron from Hungary and protect the local producers. This increased mercantilism by two. Ioannis also decided to fund the creation of a national epic about Manuel Paleologos for propaganda purposes. This would increase his prestige over time. Then he repaid the loan and now Byzantium had nine loans. The Byzantines needed to be sure that Hungary would join their offensive next war against the Ottomans. So Ioannis sent a diplomat there to carry favours with them. The next step would be the diplomatic annexation of Athens, and the diplomat was sent there to improve relations with them. In the 27th of June, Ioannis also reduced autonomy in Moreas and Burgas. In the 1st of February of 1454, great news arrived. The Ottomans were not considered a great power anymore. And Byzantium was the main reason behind that. Also now, the manpower reserves had reached the number of 6,000 men. Meanwhile, Renaissance ideas started spreading in northern Greece. Ioannis decided to support them and became a patron for Renaissance artists. Now, Byzantium had the prestige of 67. In the 14th of June of 1454, the Ottomans declared war on Kandar. In July, the truce with Albania ended, but Albania was guaranteed by Venice and Ioannis could not handle Venice at the moment. On the other hand, Herzegovina was a much easier target. But Ioannis did not seize the opportunity. This proved to be a mistake, as we will see later. In the 26th of July, Skopje was finally caught and Ioannis converted Macedonia into state. In October of 1454, Hungary owed to Byzantium 11 favours. Now they would join an offensive war against the Ottomans. Austria was still far from signing an alliance with Byzantium. In April of 1455, Bohemia announced that Byzantium was their rival out of nowhere. But alas, in the 23rd of April of 1453, the liberator of Greece, the man that resurrected the Roman Empire, the great scholar, beloved Emperor Ioannis VIII, unexpectedly died. His brother Constantinos, the Ottoman slayer, was now the new emperor. Still in mourning, Emperor Constantinos immediately had to make difficult decisions. Serbian separatists decided that now, with the death of Emperor Ioannis, it was the time to rise. A huge army of 12,000 men rose in Skopje. The army of Byzantium was much smaller. Constantinos had to hire mercenaries. After a debt restructuring, in which he repaid the loan to the burghers only to borrow even more money from them,
The Hard Grad Company, a mercenary army consisting of eight regiments. Constantinos had decided not to repeat the mistakes of his brother that paid too much money to hire mercenaries only to disband them after a while. This grand company would become an integral part of the Byzantine armies in order to conserve manpower. He was planning to use them for besieging enemy forts. Immediately after that, Constantinos received a call to arms from Hungary. They were at war with Wallachia and Herzegovina. Naturally, he accepted the call to arms. Then, prematurely, he ordered his army to engage the rebels in Skopje. Not having the needed supplies for this campaign, they were defeated. In the 26th of August, finally some good news arrived in the Byzantine court. The Serbian provinces were now integrated in the Byzantine court. Constantinos immediately converted Raskia into a state. Then he decided to use almost all of his diplomatic power to develop Kosovo. Now Byzantium had a net income from gold of 3.28 ducats. And this would increase furthermore after the war when he would be able to decrease the local autonomy in Kosovo. Byzantium, in those few months of his reign, had doubled their army and strengthened their economy significantly. In September of 1455, the Serbian rebels obliterated the small army of Herzegovina. Constantinos' luck had returned. In the 15th of November, with the help of the Hungarians, the rebels were crushed in Kosovo. Then Constantinos, in the middle of the war, felt complacent and decided to reduce the army and navy maintenance to the minimum. He also ordered all of the Byzantine forts to be mothballed. He had no intention to let the Byzantine economy bleed for the Hungarians. But then Constantinos fell sick. The nobility immediately exploited the situation and managed to increase their power and siphon off the Byzantine treasury for another decade, reducing the national tax modifier by 10%. Ioannis had lost the opportunity to annex Herzegovina and now there would be a truce with them at the end of the war. Herzegovina would be untouchable for at least five more years, unless the Hungarians in the peace deal ceded them to Bosnia on their own. A Wallachian army of 6,000 men was now at Edirne. The nobles that made all the decisions in the name of Constantinos were alarmed and increased against the maintenance of the army and put a garrison in the forts of Gallipoli and Thessaloniki. In the 6th of March of 1456, Empress Theodora finally produced an heir. His name was Adrianos. In the 18th of April, a diet was summoned and the estates proposed their agendas. The nobles, of course, decided to go with their own agenda to match the army numbers of Venice. Byzantium should have an army of 18,000 men. This would increase the army morale by 5% and would decrease the land maintenance modifier by 5%. Since the Byzantine army already consisted of 17 regiments, it would be a very easy goal to achieve with a high reward. Two months later, the agenda was completed.
Then again, they reduced the army maintenance to the minimum. Constantinos was still sick and he couldn't make any decisions regarding the Byzantine participation in this war. After that, the ruling nobles decided to increase once more the army maintenance and attack the small army of Herzegovina in Athens. It was clearly a period of irrational decisions. When the enemy left Greece, the attack was called off and the maintenance was once more decreased. Byzantium did not have a clear strategy in this war and was spending money without any purpose. The sickness of Constantinus made the situation worse. And in October, noble rebels had risen in Corinth. At least the nobles that served as advisors of the emperor in this period of sickness managed to defeat the rebels. Nevertheless, while there were no enemy armies in Greece, all the forts were maintained and in Serbia, where the enemy was going back and forth, the fort in Spederevo was mothballed. Clearly, there wasn't any real administration to make rational decisions in the Byzantine Empire. And after all that, they decided to go for the occupation of Oltenia in order to sign a white peace with Fallachia, when another faction of nobles said that Byzantium should stay in the war in case Hungary returned land from Herzegovina to Bosnia. An administrative chaos and a waste of resources. This is why this period will be remembered for. Finally, someone said something good. The Byzantines should head towards Herzegovina to help with the siege. But it was too late. Hungary signed a peace deal annexing Wallachia and giving Ham back to Bosnia. This was a present that the Byzantines clearly did not deserve. In March of 1458, Constantinus felt somewhat better and resumed his emperorship. His first decision was to seize land from the estates, but the monthly local autonomy continued to increase. In the 1st of April, Constantinus proceeded to the diplomatic annexation of Athens. Meanwhile, Orthodox zealots rose in Bosnia. Constantinus thought that they should remain unharmed in order to convert the Catholic provinces of Bosnia to the true faith. In May, Constantinus finally reduced the local autonomy in Kosovo and Skopje. Byzantium, now with an army of 20,000 men, ran a surplus of 2.68 targets. The Kosovo mine had started to produce benefits. Constantinus, feeling now much better, was anxious to put this army in use, but the truce with the Ottomans ended in five years from now. Meanwhile, Byzantium was ready to make its first administrative reform. 
Constantinos decided to strengthen the noble privileges for an increase of 15% in the national manpower modifier. The Roman Empire was growing and would need more men for the army. The Vatagis family, the family of the Empress, decided to help to develop the infrastructure in Kosovo. Constantinos further developed the gold mine in Kosovo. Now Byzantium had an income of 5 ducats from this source only and a surplus of 3.60 ducats. The economy was finally on track. The army was reorganized and the Byzantines waited for the truce with the Ottomans to end. But Byzantium still had many loans to repay. Hungary would help Byzantium in a war against Venice, but Constantinus had other priorities. The Ottomans first was his dogma. Also Venice was still guaranteeing the independence of Albania, so there were no diplomatic opportunities for an easy war for the Byzantines. Constantinus would have to wait for the right moment. In the 1st of October of 1458, Byzantium had an administrative technological advance. Now Constantinus could use the churches throughout the empire to enhance his tax income. In December of 1458, the Serbian rebels in Zeta were defeated. In January of 1459, Constantinus included Zeta in the state of Raskia. and decreased the local autonomy there. In March the 9th, the dream of the Byzantines came true. Austria decided to change its stance from neutral to friendly. Constantinos immediately signed an alliance agreement with Austria. A month later, a royal marriage was arranged. Furthermore, Hungary was a junior partner of Austria. Now Constantinus would have the armies of two countries to help him fight the Ottomans. The only problem was that Austria did not owe Byzantium enough favors to participate in that war. And then, the moment that Constantinus was at his highest, possessing a big army, a prospering economy and having Austria-Hungary ready to help him crush the Ottomans for good, fate knocked his door. Constantinos Paleologos died on the 16th of May of 1459 in a hunt accident. We can hear his own master plan in his own words that led Byzantium in this advantageous position. We will build an army to match their forces at least in the Balkan sides, and we need to have on our side the Albanian general Skanderberg and the knights with their ships. When we take Gallipoli and block the straits, they will surrender. Having secured Greece in the peace deal, we will be able to persuade the princes of the West to finally settle and decide that they will help us because we will not be a lost cause anymore. An alliance with Austria or Poland would save us long term. All that Byzantium was right now was his accomplishment, even though his actual reign did not last very long. His wife Theodora was now ruling the country through a regency council. Theodora was a very competent ruler that had to offer much administrative, diplomatic and military power in the Byzantine government. Her first decision was to convert Serbia into a state. There was some instability in the empire those first days of her regency. The Byzantine people would not easily accept to be ruled by a female ruler. In July of 1459, a royal marriage with Austria and Bosnia strengthened 
the Byzantine bonds with those two countries. Theodora immediately asked her advisors to prepare a report about the diplomatic opportunities that were available for an easy offensive war. The prime targets should be territories populated by Greeks or otherwise Orthodox people. Unfortunately, the Knights had an alliance with Venice and Cyprus had an alliance with the Mamluks, among others. The next step was to start carrying favors with Austria. Theodora would need their help in their offensive next war against the Ottomans. In January of 1460, Theodora decided to appoint new diplomats. In May, she reduced the loans of Byzantium to eight. Now Byzantium could fully maintain an army of 20,000 men and still having a budget surplus. Meanwhile, the Byzantine army defeated the Serbian rebels in Kosovo once more. Also, the Byzantine manpower had increased to 13,600 men. In July of 1460, Theodora managed to stabilize the Byzantine realm. Meanwhile, in October, Byzantium had another reform in the military. Theodora decided to standardize the use of pikes in the Byzantine army. This increased combat width by 2, infantry shock by 0.15, cavalry shock by 0.20, and also allowed the recruitment of a new unit for the Byzantine army. Eastern Militia Meanwhile, Ragusa was guaranteed by the Ottomans. This meant that during the war with the Ottomans, Ragusa would be virtually undefended. Theodora asked her diplomats to fabricate a claim. With the integration of Serbia into the Byzantine war, Finally, the Byzantine throne held enough land to stop the estate from increasing local autonomy in their province. Also now Byzantium had a reduction of only 10% in the national tax modifier. Now autonomy was decreasing. The Byzantine throne had finally consolidated its power over the whole country. The rebels were defeated, the treasury increased by 5 ducats per month and an army of 20,000 men were here to protect Byzantium. Now it was time for a new territorial expansion. In May of 1461, a respectful mason approached Theodora. He reported that Acropolis, the great monument of Athens, was not in a good condition and that its maintenance was abandoned. Theodora did not have time for that. She had much more pressing matters. Then she met the Patriarch of Constantinople to discuss some liturgical reform. Theodora decided to support the reform. This increased the Patriarch authority and the clergy loyalty. Now Patriarch authority was at around 20%. Theodora asked the Patriarch to commission the construction of the icon of St. Mike. This increased the discipline of the Byzantine armies by 5% and the manpower recovery speed by 10%. In August, the nobility had a demand about enforcing some clothing rules concerning the burghers. Theodora refused to obey the nobility. This reduced their loyalty, but also their influence. In October of 1461, Theodora repaid another loan. Now Byzantium had seven loans. The interest payments were reduced to 0.97 ducats. 
only two loans remain at the high interest rate of 4%. On December, a claim was fabricated on Ragus. And Theodora sent a diplomat to start fabricating claims in Venice. Also, Byzantium researched marketplaces. Now Theodora could build marketplaces to improve the trade power of each province. In April of 1462, Theodora used her administrative power and influence to decrease inflation by 2%. After six months of negotiations, Theodora commissioned a painter to make her portrait. This increased the prestige and stability of Byzantium. Her regency was becoming more desirable to her subjects. In August of 1462, the Byzantine budget produced a monthly surplus of 6.19 ducats and Byzantium had a manpower of 19,000 men. In November, Theodora had to pay for some business failures of her family. That same month, she thought of sending a diplomat to start negotiations with Bosnia for their diplomatic annexation. Those negotiations would take years to complete because the Byzantine diplomatic reputation after the diplomatic annexation of Athens was very low. So, she postponed the implementation of this plan. In December, she confirmed that when Byzantium accumulated 10 favors with Austria, they would join the war against the Ottomans, and this would happen before the end of the truce with them. As 1463 finally came along, Theodora got a report from her spies that the Ottoman fleet was much inferior than the Byzantine. Byzantium had more early carracks, more galleys and more ships in total. Furthermore, the Ottomans did not have a military technological advantage against Byzantium. In May of 1463, Theodora integrated in their respective states the last remaining provinces in Serbia and reduced their autonomy. This would increase their unrest, but Theodora didn't care. She needed the money. In July, she fabricated a claim on Evia. She also summoned a diary. There, she decided to follow the proposition of the nobility to develop their lands in Gallipoli. This increased the manpower of Byzantium and the loyalty of the nobility. Then she used that to seize land once more from the estate. Now the crown owned the 25% of land in Byzantium. Theodora needed to reach at least 30% in order to avoid penalties in the Byzantine economy. In September of 1463, Theodora increased the maintenance of the army to the maximum. In October, Austria was ready to join the war against the Ottomans. Everything was in its place. Everything was ready. In the 1st of December of 1463, the truce with the Ottomans ended.
Theodora announced the Byzantine provinces of interest mainly in the Balkans. and in the 30th of December declared war on the Ottomans for the conquest of Plovdiv, which was the war war. Austria, Hungary and the Knights would also join the war. This war was nothing like the first war with the Ottomans. The careful planning of those 15 years, the economic growth, the military progress of the Byzantine army both in numbers as well as in quality and the help of Austria and Hungary meant that the Ottomans would be in a serious disadvantage this time. It was expected to be an easy war. But we will talk about this war in the next episode.